So this morning, the message will be on fear of the Lord. Um, can, is the slides up and running? Sweet. Oh, yes. Thank you. Um, so I'll run through quickly the structure of today's message. We'll go through what fear of the Lord is, and then we'll talk about why we should, and then we'll end with some reflection and application. So Roy gave me free reign of what to talk about this morning, and to me this topic stood out, and it was an easy choice. It's one I found um, I took a while to understand, being relatively a new Christian. Uh, Earlier on in my journey of faith, all I seemed to know about God was how loving he is. I used to have the misunderstanding of that God loves us so much that he sent Jesus to die for us and that we were saved no matter what. I remember having a long debate with my brother. He asked the great question, if your God is so loving, why does he do such horrible things in the Old Testament? Given at the time I only knew of God's love and not much else, um, I couldn't answer his question. And I said something silly like, I don't know, I was gone to the Old Testament. (laughs) Um, I cringe when I think back to that. We know that our God is a God that does not change. Um, But back then, I fully missed his holiness, his righteousness, and all those other attributes that manifest through his wrath. I only saw God as a loving figure. It wasn't a God I could be scared of, so I lacked honour, respect, and reverence of him. I look around the community today, and I can't help but feel scared for everyone not because of COVID or because of global warming, but because of just the lack of fear of the Lord in the community. And this is scary because if we go to Romans 1, it said that God's simmering anger can be seen through a nation's increase in sinful desires of the heart, such as sexual sin, degrading of their bodies, and God giving people over to homosexuality. And unfortunately, we can see this increasing in Australia today, can't we? And I can't help but think that God's wrath is boiling over our nation too. Our country is filled with God-haters, sinfulness and arrogance. Some other examples of why I think there is a lack of fear of the Lord in the community. People around us seem to be fine with most sins, such as lying, stealing, cheating and sexual immorality. We place very little consequences on our sins. Taking his name in vain is another example. Oh my, God is said quite often without a thought or consciousness of God's presence. Or churches that praise and worship like it's a party in the music concert, you know, praise and worshipping like, yeah, there's no fear of the Lord at all. And so I think we can all benefit from a reminder today of what it means to fear the Lord. Next slide, please, Daniel. Thank you. So let's begin by defining what the topic today means. Number one, fearing the Lord is knowing God. It is understanding and appreciating his character. In Proverbs chapter 2, verse 5, Saul said to his son, If you seek it like silver and search for it as hidden treasures, then you will understand ooh, sorry, the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. So God is loving, merciful, and forgiving, but he is also holy, just, and righteous. The second uh, meaning of what fear of the Lord is can be found in Deuteronomy chapter 9, verses 18 to 19. Sorry, I'm jumping around quite a bit. So in Deuteronomy 9, 18 to 19, Moses is frightened for Israel and said, I ate no bread and drank no water because of all the sin he had committed, doing what was evil in the Lord's sight and so arousing his anger. I feared the anger and the wrath of the Lord, for he was angry enough with you to destroy you. So fear of the Lord is also recognising God's anger about sin and his power to punish those who stand against him and break his laws. Fearing him is accepting the fact that his justice and his holiness cause him to judge sin. Next slide, please, Daniel. Thank you. So now that we know what fear of the Lord means, why should we fear the Lord? 
So we can go to uh, Luke 12, and um, we'll talk about three things that uh, why we should fear the Lord. So first reason, because God will uncover the truth. Second reason, because God has the authority to throw you into hell. And third reason, because you are valuable to him. So let's go to Luke chapter 12 and paint, help paint the picture for us. So in Luke chapter 12, here Jesus was on a journey towards Jerusalem as large crowds gathered to hear him. Jesus turns around and speaks to his disciples about why they should fear the Lord. This passage comes after Luke chapter 11, verses 53 to 54, where there was a display of opposition from the Pharisees towards Jesus. The disciples probably felt anxious leading up to the crucifixion, being associated with Jesus. After all, Jesus was hated amongst the Pharisees and teachers of the law. Jesus helps give the disciples peace by putting fear into perspective. So Jesus' first reason to fear the Lord, God will uncover the truth. So in verses 2 to 3 in Luke 12, it says, Nothing is covered up that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. Therefore, what you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light, and what you have whispered in the private rooms shall be proclaimed on the housetops. So God sees what human beings don't see, shall be proclaimed on the housetops. Everything we think, everything we say, everything we do, it will be, yeah, we, we are, it will be revealed and proclaimed. So isn't that quite scary? We're accountable for every single thing we do. So for me, all the times I think of bad, judgmental thoughts about other people, all the times I may have cheated on my tax a little or take a little stingy shortcut on subscription TV, all the times I may have looked at another woman lustfully, all these things that I thought no one else could see, thinking I may have gotten away with it, but God sees, he knows we're accountable both now and on the day of our judgment for all that we have done. Jesus' second reason why, God has authority to throw us into hell. So in Luke 12, verses 4 to 5, it says, I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body and after that have nothing more they can do, but I warn you whom to fear. Fear him who, after he has killed the body, has authority to cast both body and soul into hell. Then Jesus repeats it again. Yes, I tell you, fear him. If we think that Jesus loves everyone, how come he talks about hell the most? In fact, Jesus speaks about hell more than anyone else in the Bible. Even here, where they had thousands and thousands of people that have come to listen to Jesus, he wasn't scared to offend these people by sugarcoating who God is. He could have by sharing on how loving God is. Uh, but instead, he goes straight into the truth of God's wrath and the existence of hell because we are all on our way there. Contrary to the world's view of hell, where only the worst sins, like murder, pedophilia, or robbery, seems to get you there, people, yeah, people seem to be fine, as I said before, over lying, cheating, stealing, sexual immorality. We place very little consequences on our, on our sins that when I talk to people about hell, most of them don't believe they'll end up there. They're happy to just enjoy this life, they have now and be content, thinking they are good people. God can, though, and he will send people to hell. We need to remind ourselves that God loves righteousness more than he loves people. Noah's flood is an example of this. If we do believe in hell, then what is it? Why should it scare us? So I'll digress quickly to Luke chapter 16, verses 19 to 27. So this is uh, the passage where it's a parable with Lazarus and the rich man. So Luke 16, verses 19 to 27. There was a rich young man who was clothed in purple and fine linen, who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. 
Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side, which in this parable is heaven. The rich man also died and was buried, and in Hades, which is hell in this case. Being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner bad things, but now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you a great chasm has been fixed, in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. Eternal punishment, just punishment forever. Once you end up in hell, you cannot cross. That is where you stay, cut out from God's presence. It is something we should be very scared of. We don't just go to hell and banish from existence. It is the eternal lake of fire that never ends, that never goes out. We are storing wrath for ourselves on judgment day from our sin in the mind, our sin from our lips, and our behaviours. And that's why we should fear God, who has the authority to throw us there. So we're going back to the third reason of why we should fear him. Fear him because you are valuable to him. So this is back in Luke 12, verses 6 to 7. It says, Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And not one of them is forgotten before God. Why? Even the hairs on your head are all numbered. Fear not. You are more valuable than many sparrows. Because God valued us first, we also want to value God's opinion of us. Just like how our parents first loved us, they raised us, they worked hard to make sure we had food on the table, shelter above our heads, that we had good education, and most importantly, that we felt safe in their hands. Now, how should we act towards our parents? Well, we love them, we want to please them, we don't want to break their hearts. Likewise, we want to honour God in the same way. So Jesus' message here in Luke 12 overall is to comfort his disciples, telling them not to fear humans, what people think of you, what people will do to you. The worst they can do is persecute us and kill our body. Instead, we need to fear God who has the ultimate power over life and death, who sees everything, who knows you so well, and who values you. This applies to us just as much as it did to the disciples back in Luke 12. Jesus is essentially saying that we need to have a healthy respect of God so that it makes us more concerned about obeying God over any human being. I remember in our, in our Bible study group, we watched a documentary, I think it was called American Gospel. One of the guys had a good analogy that stuck with me. He used the illustration of a car yard. If you scratch, say, an old second-hand car, you'll get into a little bit of trouble. Maybe have to pay a bit of compensation. Now, if you go and scratch a brand new Ferrari, then you'll get into a lot more trouble now, wouldn't you? Now, God, who is infinitely more valuable than this Ferrari, how much more trouble will we get into when we sin against him? God is so holy, so righteous, that no matter how little or how much we sin, eternal punishment is actually a just sentence for our crimes. Slide four, please. So let's, let's go to a bit of a practical application or self-reflection. How do I know if I'm on the right track? I'll go through three things we can reflect on. Firstly, do we obey his commands? So let's visit Proverbs 14, verse 2, which says, Whoever walks in uprightness fears the Lord, but he who is devious in his ways despises him. If we truly fear the Lord, we will obey his commands. The course of our life will be shaped by the word of God and we say no to sin. Like the previous example of God knowing everything, what do we do when no one is watching? If you're alone with your thoughts, what do you think about? 
when you're alone by yourself? What do you think you can get away with? When we disobey God, do we feel that we've do we feel sad that we've hurt God? And when we do, do we repent? Because if we are stubborn in our ways, not conforming to God's character and will, then we despise him. A second indication of whether we fear the Lord is through our evangelism. Evangelism won't get far if there is no fear of the Lord in the church. How are we doing in this space? As we saw from Luke 12, a healthy respect of God should make us more concerned with obeying him over any human being. Do we fear the risk of damaging relationships, becoming unpopular amongst our friends over the fear of the Lord? Do we fear losing our jobs by becoming that Christian guy in our workplace more than we fear the Lord? I know I'm guilty of this, and I easily shy away from spreading the gospel for the unhealthy fear of human beings. A third example of reflection. Do we worry often? Because if our fears in this life are the same as the fears of our next-door neighbour who has no room for God, what does that say about us? This sort of ties into what Rory preached on from Matthew 8 a few weeks ago when Jesus calmed the storm. Like the disciples, do we have a single worry at all? Unfortunately, I know I do. And it's just another evidence of my lack of fear of the Lord. Slide five, please. So, what are some practical things we can do to keep working and improving on our fear of the Lord? I'll go through three things we can do. Number one, we need to pray and ask the Lord to teach us, reveal more of himself to us, and give us an undivided heart. Just like the psalmist in Psalms 86 verse 11, we are in need of constant teaching. We know that our hearts are often divided and therefore unable to walk in God's path. We can be confident like the psalmist that a prayer for an undivided heart is answered. Number two, we need to continue and study the scriptures. Study and remember what the definition, oh, going back to the definition of what fear of the Lord is at the beginning, is the whole and balanced view of who God really is in light of the scriptures. Again, revisiting Proverbs 2, verse 4 to 5. If you seek it like silver and search for it as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. So here, Solomon is speaking to his son, instructing him in the ways of wisdom. I think Solomon's main point is in verse 5. Then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. How? In verse 4, Solomon says, if you seek it like silver and search for it as for hidden treasures. So it won't happen by accident. We need to put the effort in. Like a miner hungry for his precious metals and minerals, such as silver in this case, he would hunt for it with a patience through disappointments and difficulties to keep digging with a willingness and a desire to find that silver. So for me, for example... I should be praying and reading God's word more than how much time and effort I put into cycling, for example. I get up very early in the morning to ride before work. I clean my bike twice a week. I look online in the marketplace for bikes to buy because the rule of how many bikes you can own is N plus one, where N is the number of bikes you currently own. Um, I research about the mechanics of it, how to fix everything, how to become a fitter and faster rider. And the list goes on and on and on. I know Roy and Samson and China probably know about it and get sick of it, especially Maywen, my wife. She knows how many bikes go in and out of the house. It's not good. So imagine how much more I would know God if I put just as much effort, if not more, into reading the Word of the Lord than I put into cycling. So now that we've answered why we read the Bible, which is to know God better, let's digress quickly again on how we should read it. I'm going to reference uh, David Pawson because I like how he breaks it up. He breaks it up into three categories. First category, the verse approach, where people are looking for a word for themselves. He puts it as the horoscope method for reading the Bible. You read until a verse fits your situation, and that's your horoscope for the day. But it's not the right way to read the Bible because you might get a word of comfort, you might get a word of guidance here and there, but essentially... 
You're being self-centered. You're reading the Bible for yourself. Second way he puts it is reading the Bible for the sake of other people, looking for something you can teach or preach to other people. You look for passages instead of verses. And the third and final way, reading for the sake of getting to know God as the main reason so that you know what kind of a God he is, how he responds to us, how he feels about us, and what he will do with us. If you read the Bible for yourself or for the sake of reading it for others, then only a passage here and a passage there will come alive for you. If you read it to get to know God, then every single part of the, of the Bible will come alive for you. And I have to say, I agree with him. We want to be in awe of God, his righteousness, his holiness, his mercy and his grace. We don't want to disrespect him and we don't want to break his heart because the God of unconditional love is probably the most damaging and dangerous thing for all of us. Treating God as a genie, a God that we desire, but it's not really who he is. A God that would never be, it's a God that I would never be afraid of, but it will lead us into hell. Sorry, that was a long detour. Um, Last but not least, number three, surround ourselves with brothers and sisters of Christ. Let's keep each other accountable with our walk with Christ. Can I encourage everyone to make sure that we stay in touch with one another, that we check on, check in on each other, and that we join a bubble study group? Because let's face it, we are so broken, we cannot do it ourselves. I love our bubble studies each week, small groups where we can comfortably share our struggles, our concerns or our praise points. Not only do we feed each other from the word of God, but we pray for each other, we share our struggles, knowing that when people know our sins, we are likely to be more accountable. Whenever we have two weeks break from it during the school holidays, I can already feel I'm getting lazier with my walk with him. Uh, Last slide, please. To wrap up, ultimately we know that we can't perfectly fear the Lord and that's why we need the gospel all the more. Good news for us is that we have Jesus Christ who died to cover us for our sins. Jesus made us new in Christ. He made us upright. We can press on to know God better with the confidence we have in in Christ. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. If we go back, just two verses back from that, John 3, 14 to 15, it shows that God gives us a way out. Jesus says, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life. Jesus is referring to when the Israelites were in the wilderness for 40 years. God provided food for them during this time. However, the Israelites grumbled and disobeyed God. So God sent snakes down to punish them until the Israelites pleaded with Moses. God then gave them a way out, an antidote because of his grace and his mercy. In the same way, God hates what we do. We are unlovable when we sin. We deserve death because of how holy and how righteous he is. However, in his grace and mercy... God also gives us a way out by sending his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. How do we know that we truly believe? It is confessing that Jesus is our Lord. If we say it to our spouses, to our friends, to our families, and we mean it, then God is at work in our lives. We long in our hearts to obey the Lord, not taking God's grace and mercy for granted, To sum up and close, the fear of the Lord is a biblically balanced view of who God is. If you only emphasize on some of God's attributes and not others, such as his love and nothing else, then you get a skewed view of who God really is. However, it's just as important to not go to the opposite side of the spectrum, because if we only emphasize on God's justice, God's wrath, then we won't draw near to him because we will utterly be afraid of him. We want the whole picture of God in light of the scriptures so that we may have a healthy fear of him. We want to love him. We want to be in awe of him. We don't want to break his heart. 
and we don't want to disrespect him. So, yeah. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word and that you've uh, given us a way out, Lord, through Jesus. We ask, Lord, and we pray for an undivided heart and that as we read your word, that you reveal more and more of yourself through your word, Father God. And uh, help us, Lord, to live out more of our lives uh, like Jesus and to be more like Jesus, Father God and uh, to continue to carry out your will. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.